Let's go ahead and stand together for the reading of the gospel. Which comes from the gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. And you can find that in your pew Bibles, or you can also follow along on the screen. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Spirit, you are here. And as we just opened up the most important words ever spoken or known to mankind, we pray that your words would penetrate our hearts. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hijacked. Hijacked. To seize, divert, or appropriate a vehicle that is in motion or an object that is in transit. Many of us sitting in here this morning, when we hear the word hijacked, we squirm. We feel uncomfortable. Maybe a rainbow of emotions are flooding into your brain as when you hear this word hijacked, you think of 9-11 or you think of the 1970s hijacking. And maybe you're thinking, what on earth is Pastor Terabeth thinking using such a strong word on a Sunday morning? But this week, God took me on a journey with this word, hijacked. And so I'd like to pose a question for all of you this morning. Have your hearts been hijacked? Maybe you've heard the phrase, well, I don't know, my heart's just not in it. You know what I mean, where you walk into an event or you're in a relationship with someone and you're just not feeling it. Or maybe you're there, but you're not really present. You know, maybe when you come in on a Sunday morning and you hear the words, you hear the prayers, you heard the sermon spoken, you participate in the worship, and you're there, you're standing in the room, but you're not really there. You enter into the sanctuary and you close your eyes for prayer and you watch everyone else crying out to God and you overhear the prayers and as you close your eyes, you realize it's been all week since you've talked to God or all month, or all year, or longer. Or maybe you're sitting at Starbucks and you overhear someone having a conversation about the Bible quite passionately, and as you listen in, you realize it's been a long time since you've cracked open your Bible. Or maybe you wake up one morning and you you splash some water on your face and you look in the mirror and you look at yourself dead square in the eye and you think to yourself, Who have I become? 
I used to be so joy-filled, so peace-filled, so love-filled and patient. Or maybe on a Sunday morning when the tithe plate is passed across the pews, you put your nose up in the air and you fold your arms in anger thinking, if only the church knew about all the bills I had to pay. Or maybe you're having a conversation with your beautiful wife or husband, and instead of speaking life-giving words, you're speaking words laced with hatred and words that tear your spouse down. Or maybe you're here this morning and your brain still hasn't left work. Maybe it rarely does leave work. You're constantly thinking about it and about the bottom line. Or maybe you're here this morning and you find yourself ridden with anxiety, with fear, with worry, flooded with all of the what it is, flooded with the to-do list and the pile that is upon our lives. Or maybe you're here this morning and that you find that your brain is still focused on that addiction, whatever it might be, when you can get that next fix. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking to yourself as you're watching the Spirit move and people respond and you're thinking, what am I doing here? It doesn't matter because you're here. And it's not an accident, brothers and sisters, that you are here. Because God has a word for you. And so as we begin this week of spiritual renewal, come, Lord Jesus, come. Fill our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength. I want you to think about that question. Has your heart been hijacked? The theme verse for Maranatha comes from a passage of scripture known as the Shema, or as others call the Jesus Creed, which we read from Mark chapter 12, but is in fact found in all of the synoptics and found in all over scripture to love God with everything. And so here in particular in this passage in Mark chapter 12, Jesus was standing and having a conversation with religious leaders. They were putting Jesus to the test, to test his knowledge and to see how he would answer. And in fact, just before this, they were trying to trick him into saying that he didn't believe in the resurrection. They posed a question about marriage in heaven. And after that question, they, they corner him with another question. And they ask him, Jesus, tell us, what is the most important commandment? This was a question that wasn't uncommon for religious leaders, for they would often stand in the temple courts, the religious leaders, and debate which were the most weightier commandments and which were the lighter ones, which are the more positive ones and which are the more negative ones. And they would try to rate them. In fact, they had all sorts of other literature out there to explain away some of the commandments and how a person should live. There were over 600 laws Jesus could have chosen there in that moment, but Jesus responds this way. He says, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. He pulled from a passage of scripture found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, which reads as this. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So as you can see for the people of Israel, this was an instrumental and important passage. In fact, the people of Israel didn't only see this as a commandment, but this was seen as a profession of faith. This is how they professed what they believed in. They believed in a God that was one. 
and they believe that they should love God with everything, their entire being, their hearts, their souls, and their minds. And in fact, the most pious Jews would repeat this throughout the day. But Jesus tacks on another important passage of scripture found in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, which also had precedence in Jewish circles. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. So Jesus pulls in these two instrumental passages for the Jewish people to love God with everything and to love your neighbor. And he says there is no other commandment greater than these. And even today as Christ followers, this is the commandment that defines us. That with every breath, every waking moment, we are to love God with everything, with our hearts, with our minds, our souls, and our strengths, this vertical relationship with God. And when we do that, it impacts the horizontal relationships. It should be a natural outflow in loving our neighbor. And so this morning, I want to take a look at what it means to love God with our heart. For a lot of us sitting in this room, we think of heart as love, or it's popular among teenagers to write, I heart you. And some of us, maybe our brain goes to the most literal place, an organ inside of our body. We're trying to teach Caleb, our three-year-old, what it means to love God with his entire heart, and he thinks it's literally his heart. Just the other day, he said to us, he said, Mommy, when I eat my food, it goes down into my mouth and down my throat, and I knock over Jesus in my heart. He thinks that Jesus is literally in his heart, and he's fearful that he's going to knock Jesus over when he eats his food. But I want to look at two different meanings, yet connected, in which the the people of Israel looked at heart, how they understood heart. And the first way that they understood heart is a desire, will, or longing. Desire, will, or longing. In other words, the heart was a storehouse, if you will, of one's desires or of one's will or of one's longing or inner dreams. For example, Psalm 21 verse 2 says this, You have granted him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips. And so here the writer of the psalm connects heart and desire with lips. In other words, the inner longings and the desires flow from the heart and out of one's mouth. Okay, so the heart is a storehouse of one's desire. Again, in Proverbs 13, 12, it reads this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Again, a heart is the storehouse of one's longing or desires. And here's an example in Deuteronomy chapter 8, where one's desires are no longer having a heart or desire or longing for God, but their heart was hijacked, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 14 reads this. Then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God. So here again, this is an example of the heart having desires and longings or manifestations that aren't necessarily purposed for God but are turning their heart against God. And the second way that they looked at the heart was decisions of the will or obedience. In other words, we might have a heart that is prideful or we might have a heart that has evil desires, but God can come in and change that heart. We've seen that in many places. God can change the heart from it being a heart of stone to a heart of flesh and us being able to then respond in obedience. Here's an example. Proverbs 16:19. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Here again, Psalm 20, verse 4. May he give you the desire of the heart and make all your plans succeed. May he give you the desire of our heart. So maybe, maybe it's a God that comes in and changes the desires of our heart for a life that is purpose for him. 
Again, Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give, you, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. When we give God our heart and our entire heart, we begin to delight in his ways. And here is the last one, Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 through 20. This is God impacting the heart or changing the heart into a life of obedience. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Then they will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. God coming in and changing a heart of stone and making a heart of flesh, one that is pliable, one that is moldable so that the person can then live a life of obedience in response to God, where they're saying, yes, I will be your people and you will be my God. And so I want you to think about that as I bring us back to the question that I posed to all of us earlier when I brought up the word hijacked. We squirmed, we got uncomfortable. But I wanna ask you again, when you think about the storehouse of your heart, what are your longings and what are your desires? Or what is at the seat of your heart? Or what are you living for? Or who or what do you most desire? Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven describes a church whose heart had in fact been hijacked. You can open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, and you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to it and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. But whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat at the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. So here we have a people of God that clearly once loved God with their entire heart. We are introduced to this church in the book of Acts, and then again, Paul writes a letter to the church of the Ephesians, and in the first chapter, he praises them for their love for God. This was a church that was known for loving God with their hearts and loving their neighbors. But then we come to Revelation chapter two, and we see something had changed Something shifted where he says, I hold this one thing against you. You have abandoned your first love. Now the Jewish Christian reader of that day would have read that and would have said, oh, they're talking about the Shema. Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. So what happened to them? I believe that their hearts became hijacked. You see, the church of Ephesus was at the very center of the land and sea trade. It was one of the most influential cities in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. In it had big marble pillars with beautiful buildings and stadiums and temples. It was a city known for its great wealth and money. A lot of money came into the city and a lot of money went out of the city. And it was also a city that was known for its idol worship. And here we see that they are affirmed for keeping their values, for persevering through hardships and troubles, but it is clear 
and it is obvious that their hearts were captivated by something else. Maybe it wasn't something that happened overnight. Maybe it was a slow fade or a slow drift where they were lured into all the distractions that the city boasted of idol worship, of wealth, of having everything that they needed, of living quite a comfortable life. Whatever it was that hijacked their hearts, it is clear they no longer loved God with their hearts as they once had. For they had lost the thing that was most important, loving God. And so some of you might be thinking here this morning, well, pff, I'm good, Tara Beth. I'm not wealthy. And I don't worship idols. So I'm good to go. But not so fast. Because there are so many things in this world that can creep into your heart and pulling you away from loving God with your entire heart. Where once your heart can be a storehouse that is purpose for desire and longing for God. Where once maybe your heart was a heart of flesh where you wanted God with everything and you said, take my heart, mold it, shape it, I am yours to it slowly turning into a heart of stone and instead of a desire for God replaced with pride. And so I want to ask you the question again and I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I have been asking you throughout this entire message is if your heart has been hijacked Maybe you're here and you've been here this morning and you've been here Sunday after Sunday, but you're not really here. Maybe you hear the sermons, the songs, but you're not really in it. You enter into the sanctuary, you close your eyes for prayer, and you realize it's been weeks, months, days since you've talked to God. Maybe you woke up one morning and you looked at yourself in the mirror and you've asked yourself, who have I become? I once used to be so full of joy, life, and love. Or maybe Sunday after Sunday the tithe plate is passed and you put your nose up in the air with anger inside of you and say, why would I give the church any money? I have bills to pay. Or maybe you have conversations with your beautiful wife and instead of speaking life-giving words, you speak words laced with hatred. Or maybe most mornings you wake up and you think of ways of getting out of your marriage and escape. And so maybe the only escape you know of is behind a bottle or a computer or at your workplace. Or maybe you're here and you're so addicted to pleasure that you would do anything to achieve it above anything else. Or maybe you've become so obsessed with keeping appearances that you want to make sure everyone knows that you have it together when inside you're really in inner turmoil. Or maybe you're here and you're so overcome by grief that you feel like you just can't think or see straight. Or maybe you're here and you're so obsessed with the next best thing, the next best accomplishment, the next best raise, the next best house. Or maybe you're here and your brain still hasn't left work. Or maybe you're here and you find that your brain is still on that addiction that you still can't seem to shake. Or maybe you're here and you're just asking yourself, what on earth am I doing here? It doesn't matter. You're here. And you're here because God wants you here. And if you're here and your heart has been hijacked by something else, 
God can change that heart and replace it with a desire and a longing for him. God can replace it and turn it into a heart of flesh. And so one last time I ask you, has your heart been hijacked? With all eyes closed, heads bowed, bowed. If your heart has been hijacked, I want to ask you to make eye contact with me. I would like to pray for you. If your heart is beating and your palms are sweating, my guess is the Holy Spirit is pursuing you. And so I invite you to make eye contact with me if your heart has been hijacked. Thank you. And I invite everyone to go ahead and stand as we respond and worship in this song. And then I want to invite those of you that did make eye contact with me. I saw you. I'd like to invite you to make the bold step to step out of your pews and come to the altar so we can pray for you. Because it's not too late for God to change that heart into a heart that desires and longs for more of him. So you can come now. Until you have it all, my heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all, my heart is yours. Sing that again. You won't relent until you have it all.
Lord. We know that you come to us and you ask us for our heart. But Lord, you don't do it in a way that you're trying to take something away from us, Lord. Lord, you do it in a way that you're trying to give us everything that we need and desire. Lord, help us to understand that you love us. That you want the best for us. But sometimes the things that we personally want get in the way. Lord, I pray that you would be with us throughout this time of Maranatha and in the weeks and months to come. That this isn't just something that we do and come and do for a couple days and then go back to our normal routine. But Lord, out of this time of spiritual renewal, we're changed. We're changed to love you to know you deeper and to affect the others, people around us. Lord, be with us in this week as we turn our face to look upon you. We pray this in your name. Amen.